Uh, hello and welcome to uh, the final Nano Explorations talk for this academic year hosted by MIT Nano. My name is Tom Gertie. I'm Director of Initiatives for MIT Nano and I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this talk. Um, this is not only the final talk of this year, it's also a return to the beginning of the program. Start. Uh, Nano Explorations started in the month after the pandemic uh, as a way to keep people connected. We are thrilled that it's still going on and doing the same thing for us today. Brendan Smith, today's speaker, was one of our first speakers back in April of 2020. Um, and he informed us just before the seminar went live that that was three days before Citration Incorporated. So it's a great opportunity to go back to the beginning of Nano Explorations and to go back to the beginning of Citration and check in with Brendan and see how things are going. Brendan Smith is the CEO and co-founder of Citration. He has a PhD in 2018 in material science and engineering from MIT. And he has gone through a very interesting journey trying to commercialize his dissertation. Citration is pioneering a sustainable and low cost filtration membrane technology useful for extracting materials from recycled batteries or the waste streams in the mining sector, just to give two examples. But it has the potential to reduce the energy input in these processes by as much as 10 times, while also enabling recovery yield over 95%. Uh, Brendan, I would be delighted for you to take over and tell us about Citration and what you're trying to do. Thanks so much, Tom. Really great to be here with everybody. Um, really honored to be in the room today. Um, it's kind of funny, I was thinking, as, as Tom was saying, the seminar was started to keep folks connected during the pandemic. I guess I kind of did the same thing, but by starting a company instead. And that's worked pretty well for me in terms of keeping, uh, staying connected with people. I'll talk about that aspect of the company as well. And it's been a very exciting journey. Uh, but first to dive in, to set the stage a little bit, uh, as was mentioned, Brendan Smith, co-founder and CEO of Citration. And everything since Citration was founded, since my last Nano Explorations talk has really changed almost completely, uh, really in a, in a great way. And so I'm excited to be here to talk about that. I'm first gonna set the stage with what we're actually working on today as a company, and then back up a little bit and talk about how we got here over the past three years, uh, how MIT.nano and Start.nano has played a massive role in that among other organizations as well. And talk about a few key learnings that I think can be applied, you know, both for folks who are looking to do something similar in terms of commercialization of early stage technologies. I think some lessons that also apply more broadly to the community as a whole. So really excited to, to do that as well. Uh, just to set the stage a little bit. So Citration today is really laser focused on the application of critical materials extraction and recovery. And this is happening in applications like in lithium ion battery recycling and also in parallel in the mining space. So I'll talk a bit about how we're sort of balancing those things and thinking really in a focused way about commercialization. So let's dive in. So I think the, as long as the slide changes here, there we go. So I think the motivation for this is probably pretty clear to, to most folks in the room, but I just wanna set the stage a little bit. Uh, critical materials are really the underlying force behind what we're thinking about as global electrification. So we know in the scientific and broader community that we absolutely are required to electrify the world in terms of industrial activity, transportation, manufacturing, really the whole nine yards, if we're going to at least stand a chance at mitigating this disaster, ongoing disaster that is climate change. You only have to look outside in Boston and New York and the whole Northeast in the last week or so to realize how important and how imminent and urgent this matter really is. And so it's broadly agreed upon that if we actually were able to now, within our reach, electrify transportation, electrify industry, we stand to save CO or reduce CO2 emissions by about 40% as soon as 2050, which seems like a long way off, but really it's not that far. And so this becomes one of the most paramount efforts that we have to undertake. But then it circles back to actually not just being about electrifying everything, it's about having the storage capacity, the generation of renewable capacity to be able to do this. And so when you talk about that one layer down, it really becomes a story about critical materials, not just about electrification. The critical materials are supporting almost entirely the batteries that we have to build, supporting the wind turbines, the solar cells, and all the infrastructure in the grid that is required to make this happen. And so we talk about critical materials, a brief background here, we're really talking about in the context of batteries, uh, lithium, nickel, and cobalt. And they're arranged on this figure in sort of a very intentional way. Uh, lithium is sort of the foundational critical material, as you could probably guess, the namesake of the lithium ion battery. And it's broadly 
understood that lithium is not going anywhere anytime soon in these battery chemistries. So you can have you know, a whole slew of different lithium ion battery chemistries. But one thing they have in common is the lithium. So nickel and cobalt are a little bit less of a fixture, but still very much so. So you may know that cobalt is over time being sort of, I wouldn't say phased out, but at least increased in terms of the ratio in the battery chemistry, uh, largely based on supply chain constriction. So about 80% of the world's cobalt comes from the Congo and under pretty poor humanitarian and environmental conditions. So over time, things like nickel and manganese are increasing in concentration relative to cobalt, but it's still a very, very important critical material. And so just to kind of put some numbers behind this, uh, this figure looks um, na namely at lithium carbonate. So the key, along with lithium hydroxide, the key lithium compound in battery manufacturing. What we see here is a, a bit of a, a projection for benchmark mineral, uh, mineral intelligence, kind of the key mineral forecasting agency. And we can see that the demand is projected to outstrip supply by about 150 or 200% as soon as 2040. And, and in fact, the shortages are supposed to start much earlier than that as per these projections. And nickel and cobalt have similar kind of supply constrictions forecasting in the future. And so what's gonna make up this gap in the supply and demand uh, has to be kind of twofold. One is more creative and more resourceful and more sustainable primary extraction or mining. We're never gonna be able to get away from that in the next 50 to 100 years. But the second thing where we can make a lot more ground in the near term is actually lithium mine battery recycling. And the reason there is because we're barely doing that at all today. Only about 10 to 15% of batteries today, lithium mine batteries today are recycled. So there's a massive opportunity to start reclaiming a lot of these critical materials and putting them back into new batteries in a more sustainable way. So just to put some numbers behind this, about 5 million tons of end-of-life lithium-ion battery materials by about 2035 over the next 10 years or so. And that's not just end-of-life batteries, it's also manufacturing scrap coming out of these gigafactories that never makes it into the end-of-life battery in the first place. And you can imagine the economic opportunity is well aligned with the sustainability opportunity and, and the societal opportunity here with about a trillion dollars worth of critical materials trapped in these batteries that is today very, very hard to extract in a low cost and sustainable way. So this is where Citration's mission really comes to the forefront. We're laser focused on enabling the ultra efficient recovery of these materials in applications like lithium ion battery recycling, like mining. Uh, you'll see there are a lot of similarities between these two applications in parallel. And we're doing this in a very low cost and sustainable way to really enable that supply chain to be bolstered and catalyzed to provide the materials that we really need to build these batteries. So I think I've already sort of spoken to why this is so important. There may be some uh, aspects that you might not have heard of as well, though, at the same time. So, you know, we're of course going to lower the cost and the impacts uh, of extracting these critical materials and recycling them. Uh, we're not going to totally be able to remove the need for primary extraction based on the demand curve of these materials. You're always going to be behind the ball in terms of recycling to provide the bulk of what's needed. But you can certainly mitigate the amount of new mining that has to be done over time by a significant margin. And the last one here on the right, I think, is really interesting. So this idea of democratizing the material supply chain. So I spoke of the Congo, for instance. A lot of the materials flow is also, of course, through China in terms of recycling and refining of material, especially for lithium ion batteries. And so we're actually able to say do something like the sustainable and low cost recycling of lithium ion batteries that can happen locally all over the world. And it can actually really even the playing field, uh, both in terms of humanitarian impacts from battery recycling and also in terms of the economic impacts as well. So that's a big part of what Citration is really focused on in our work. So how do we actually do it? And what does that look like relative to the status quo? I'll just kind of go over this quickly as a high level sort of explanation. There's obviously a lot of technical detail here. Uh, we were to dig down. So the standard process today is called either hydrometallurgical or pyrometallurgical recycling. What happens here is the batteries are either burned or ground up into a powder. Uh, this is called black mass powder in the case of hydromet. And then in both cases, that resulting material is dissolved into a harsh concentrated acid solution, which you see here. And from this point in the standard process, it undergoes about 20 to 25 steps where you're one by one extracting all of the impurities, all the contaminants from that stream until you're left with your new battery materials, namely lithium, cobalt, and nickel compounds. And those are really the 90 plus percent of the total value in these end of life battery materials. This is possible. It's actually not being done today for lithium recycling because it's too complicated and too expensive. Cobalt and nickel are being recycled today, but at a very low margin. And in fact, sometimes at a loss economically for these recyclers. And they're really anticipating this boom for the market price to rise and then to be profitable in the future. 
Titration doesn't want to wait uh, for profitable battery recycling. We don't want to wait for sustainable battery recycling. And so what we're doing is actually shifting the paradigm here to something that looks very different, much more streamlined and much more efficient. So we're actually plugging into the existing process where we take this material that's been either ground up or burned down to a slag. It still gets dissolved in the acid the same way as, as currently being done. But in our case, from here, the difference is quite stark. So instead of using an entirely chemical and thermal-based treatment method, our process is totally electrified in nature. And what we're doing is we're drastically reducing the number of stages by pulling out the lithium, cobalt, and nickel compounds in the first three or four stages of the process. So we don't have to go through 20 stages, pull out all the contamination. We pull out the valuable stuff as an initial step. So you can see here the high-level impact, what that means in terms of process complexity. In terms of the quantification of the impact uh, economically and sustainability-wise, the top three cost drivers of the process, talking to all the stakeholders that we know of, are really chemical inputs, thermal energy inputs, which are very inefficient energy-wise, and the chemical waste treatment cost. And titration is substantially impacting all three of these. But an 80 to 90% reduction in chemical and thermal energy inputs in our process compared to the status quo. And subsequently, also about a 50% reduction in the volume of chemical waste that's treated at the end of the process. So when you plug this into some detailed techno-economic techno modeling, what you see is a conservative estimate of about 40% reduction in OPEX relative to the status quo. So this is very exciting, not just from a sustainability perspective, of course, but also from an economic perspective. And it's very important, of course, these two things are aligned uh, to be able to implement solutions like this industrially. So how do we actually do this? At the core of that little citration box there in our electrified process, it's a technology that was developed by myself and my co-founder, Jeffrey Grossman at MIT in the material science department. Uh, that's really the core of what Citration is doing still today, technically. I won't spend too much time here, but this is essentially a new type of filtration membrane composed entirely of a porous silicon material. So what this is, is a two-step process we've designed, uh, scaled up and patented through MIT, are now exclusively licensing that IP back for Citration, um, which is a very common practice with things invented at universities. And the two-step process essentially involves existing processes assembled in a very strategic way. So the first step is a very simple metal deposition approach. So we basically blast a bunch of metal onto the surface. This metal becomes a catalyst in the second and final step, which is a chemical etching process. So we simply dunk this whole thing in a chemical etch bath, um, which is based on water chemistry with acid. And what that chemistry achieves is to drill these tiny nanopores or micropores, essentially very, very narrow channels, from the top to the bottom of this flat silicon sheet, essentially composing our, our membrane structure. So the top, two, top three things which are most unique and, and differentiated and valuable about this technology, number one, we have a, an extreme amount of tunability with this pore diameter. So anywhere from five nanometer diameter all the way up to say five or 10 microns approaching the diameter of a human hair. And anything in between, we can kind of tune the pore size and structure to meet those requirements. Secondly, we have an ultra durable material. So silicon itself is innately durable. It can survive um, acidic conditions down to pH zero or below. And that allows us to operate directly in this harsh environment of battery recycling with little to no chemical pretreatment and no kind of thermal energy inputs prior to exposing that, that uh, process stream to the silicon membrane. And lastly, and really importantly, it's electronically conductive, as you might guess with silicon. We can tune that broadly as well over three or four orders of magnitude of electrical conductivity. And it turns out this allows us to really selectively grab out via specific processes uh, the important materials, namely lithium, cobalt, and nickel. So those three things combined together give us a uniquely differentiated value, which we're leveraging then in the critical materials recovery space. Here's a very simplified example of how that actually looks, and I'll show some images on the, on the forthcoming slides. So here we have a cross-section of the silicon membrane. Uh, it could be the same membrane in, in both cases, the exact same pore structure uh, and pore size, et cetera. What we do is just by tuning a knob, turning a knob that would change the voltage or current conditions flowing into that membrane, we can very selectively extract a very specific material. So for instance, we turn the knob once, we allow lithium to flow through the membrane, and we achieve a pure lithium solution on the other side. We turn the knob again, and this time we're actually uh, extracting cobalt from solution in a very selective way. And so this is a drastic simplification of how it actually works, and I, I can take some questions on that if there's interest. Uh, but generally, we have this ultra versatile membrane that can target a broad number of critical materials from very complex and very harsh solutions coming in. So here's an actual example from, from our recent work. So this is a cross section of a, a single citration membrane. 
what you're seeing here is the top of the material or the surface up here at the top of the slide and the backside of the membrane on the bottom of the slide. And we're looking at the actual inside of the material itself. And for context, this entire slide is about half a millimeter thick. What you can see here in these vertical gray streaks are the actual pores or channels running from one side to the other. And these largely pass all the way through the membrane, allowing that flow of dissolved battery solution or liquid to come all the way through. So what we do here is then we apply a voltage, very specific voltage to the membrane. Uh, what this does is electro extract uh, actual specific materials from that complex flow. So in this example, we're electro extracting nickel. And you can see via microscopy, um, following the, the experiment, we crack the membrane open and look at the cross section that only nickel is fixed within the material structure itself. So what you can't see here on the right side is the actual porosity or the pore structure. We can then zoom in and see uh, a much magnified version of that pore structure. And so you see these individual pores highlighted with the, the high contrast um, bright pore structure. And these little nickel seeds signified in red is actually the metallic nickel clinging to the side of the membrane. And then as a second step, we can very, very simply release that back into a very pure stream to then become a solid product like nickel sulfate. So this is just one example. We can do this for all sorts of materials in lithium ion battery recycling, as well as more broadly in the mining space as well. Just to think about scale up for a little bit. So, you know, we're still on the benchtop process scale, looking to make that leap to the, the larger kind of small pilot scale in the very near future. But really importantly, we're thinking a lot about how scalability actually looks for the titration technology. This is just an example that's the, the size of about a, an office printer, for instance. Here we're actually stacking uh, five membranes that look like this in a vertical configuration, or I should say horizontal configuration stacked in a vertical way. And the exciting thing about this is not necessarily that it's very large in and of itself, but rather you could scale this up to a refrigerator size and still have the exact same module complexity, the exact same design, just with a greater number of layers in this stack. Still the same number of pipes going in and out of this kind of module. So we're very ready to kind of make that leap as soon as we achieve our benchtop performance uh, technical metrics or parameters that we're looking for, which are also very close as well. So in terms of how this looks kind of going to market, um, it, it's quite different, quite complex, depending on the, the market or the industry that you're looking at. So as I mentioned, we're targeting both the lithium ion battery recycling uh, sector as well as the mining sector. And so with battery recycling, titration is indeed developing an end-to-end -end process, but we're actually working with uh, existing battery recyclers today, uh, as well as some EV makers and uh, battery producers, and it's becoming now very vertically integrated for many different regulatory reasons and otherwise. But we're working with these folks to get real materials and then put them through our process in a very commercially relevant way to extract your cobalt, lithium, and nickel compounds in, in a highly pure and selective manner. And so that's, that's a really important aspect of what titration is doing today. On the mining side, we are also doing a lot in terms of working with commercial partners. Uh, namely, we just kicked off a project with Rio Tinto, uh, which is very exciting for us, our first kind of major uh, multi-year commercial partnership. And there we're actually looking to treat mining wastewater, of which there is a large volume on a global scale, of course, and pull out valuable components, including cobalt nickel, for instance, um, you know, that is gonna valorize that waste treatment and at the same time mitigate uh, environmental contamination issues. So kind of two birds with one stone. So I want to uh, transition a little bit now in the last five or 10 minutes of the talk, just towards how we got here. Uh, it's been a really exciting journey. It's gone very quickly, um, but also a lot of stages along the way to look back on and really appreciate. So I, I can't say enough about the support of MIT.nano, the Start.nano program, if you're not aware. It's a program where early stage startups like Citration are allowed to come into MIT.nano, uh, utilize all the facilities, uh, typically for a reduced rate over the kind of typical corporate structure, rate structure and uh, in a really efficient way, kind of advance your startup and technology to that next commercial phase. So our team has been part of the Start.Nano program for over two years now at this point. We really recommend any kind of early stage companies who can utilize the tool sets and start in MIT.Nano uh, to look at this program really seriously. There's really, really no downside here. So Start.Nano and MIT.Nano are not the only resources, of course, that Citration has leveraged. Uh, here's sort of a larger subset of them. If you're coming out of MIT and looking to start any kind of uh, hard tech or, or software-based venture, uh, these are definitely services you should look into. The Deshpande Center, the VMS um, Mentoring Center at MIT have been extremely valuable for us. Um, then once you actually form your company, the MIT TLO for tech transfer out of MIT is essential to work with, and they've been extremely supportive and helpful. Uh, the ILP, the Industrial Liaison Program, their whole thing is to connect early stage startups or later stage startups uh, with interested corporates uh, anywhere in the world. So a lot of these connections we've made already 
have been thanks to the ILP and we're very appreciative for that. Um, two entities that are not, of course, part of MIT, but that have been absolutely instrumental for citration. On the right here, we have the NSF i program. That's really based around customer discovery. You, know, you have this great early stage technology, but where are you actually gonna use it and where can it make money and add value and impact? So that's all around going out and talking to 150 uh, commercial stakeholders to really make sure that you're developing something at the early stage that's gonna benefit society and create a lot of value. I can recommend that program enough for early stage folks like myself. And then the Activate Fellowship, a uh, really quick shout out to that. Anyone looking to start a hard tech or uh, clean tech associated company could certainly apply for the Activate Fellowship. I think they typically um, solicit applications on the October sort of timeframe. So what that is, it's a two year kind of salary support for early stage entrepreneurs like myself. And they also give a, a whole ton of uh, networking work um, and also a lot of investor kind of network and corporates as well uh, to early stage hard tech companies. So definitely recommend looking at that if you've not heard of them. And then just a few key learnings I, I kind of wanted to extract, checking the time here, perfect. Uh, a few key learnings we want to extract from the last three years. Of course, this is really distilled down. There are a lot of things we could talk about for many hours. But if I had to give sort of three pieces of advice to, to early stage folks looking to kind of set out and start a company out of an academic environment. The first is that you really want to focus on acquiring a team of really amazing individuals. Um, and, and by that, I mean people who are motivated, uh, creative, passionate about what they do, uh, really excited to come to work every day and work with you on developing something that's transformational and, and extremely impactful. So I'd say the first year or so of Citration was basically myself and Jeff, uh, my co-founder out of MIT, uh, you know, writing grant proposals, trying to get some early stage uh, venture capital funding in, really with the whole intent of hiring the first two people to the team. And so once we did this, it was transformational. We were able to get the next kind of funding rounds in terms of investment, uh, win more grant proposals, for instance. And so it really snowballs from there. But until you start to build beyond the initial uh, founding team, it be, it's very difficult to gain a whole lot of commercial traction. So definitely recommend emphasizing the team. And, and what I say on the slide here, it is very true that everything changes. So I think as an academic entrepreneur, you're very focused on your technology um, and that's okay. But you should be aware, and I think almost in 95% of cases, within three years, the technology, the market focus, and how you're actually applying the technology in that market will probably be almost unrecognizable to you from when you incorporate the company. But the team will hopefully be you know, similar and growing, but uh, that's kind of one, uh, one sort of static thing in terms of the company DNA is really who's at the company and how they're impacting your, your development. So the second thing is I really encourage people, and I think we were lucky that we got a lot of good advice on this even before we incorporated, uh, to really prioritize scalability and the techno-economics of your technology and your process and what you're developing and building, uh, really over kind of the coolness factor or the uniqueness of it. I've had a lot of interesting advice where people have said, well, you know, you could just use an off-the-shelf thing to do this. And, you know, we're, we're looking into that, of course, and that's not necessarily the case for us. Um, but it's very true that if you can do that, maybe you should. You know, there are, there are IP considerations and things get a bit more complicated. But really the important thing is that you're adding societal, environmental, economic value in the real world. So the technology itself really actually doesn't even matter at the end of the day. It's only a vessel and a vehicle for how you arrive at that ultimate uh, societal and economic impact. So that's a very good thing to keep in mind as you go through this kind of ideation phase of starting a company. And just a quick, quick kind of example here. Uh, we did think a lot about scalability and techno-economics at the beginning. So in the next one to two years, I'm uh, really looking to move towards the benchtop process today on about a 10 liter per day sort of uh, throughput capacity up to this kind of first pilot system and, you know, 2025 kind of time frame. And that should target about a thousand liters a day. So we kind of already have the machinery in place to do that. And we're looking at kicking off that kind of development effort very shortly. And then lastly, but certainly not least, I think another thing to really prioritize, you know, the team is certainly one that you want to think about expanding in the first year of, of spin out. Uh, at the same time, I think one should really be thinking about, okay, what's my actual, you know, solid foundational market? And what's the critical function I have to demonstrate to convince stakeholders and partners in that market to invest their time, resources, and attention and investment in the future uh, into my company? Um, and so it may sound obvious, but I think a lot of times people think, oh, I have a great technology, I'll start a company and I'll figure it out from there. That's kind of what we did a little bit. Um, and it's worked out well, but only because we were very quickly able to uh, sort of train ourselves in on this critical materials extraction application. 
So I know other examples where you know people had amazing protected IP, awesome differentiated unique technology. Uh, but if it takes two or three years to figure out you know your market and what you have to demonstrate to get there, it gets a lot more difficult to sustain your team growth and your commercialization effort over that time. So if you can do this before you you kick off and and spin out and launch your company, uh, that's really the ideal kind of situation. So I think that's it. I think we're we're good for time. Um, definitely some time for questions. So I would pass it back to Tom, and I'll of course be here to answer any questions that people have. And really looking forward to chatting further. All right, Brendan, thank you so much for that presentation. It's terrific to see uh, how far you've come. We have a few questions in the Q and A, and I'd encourage anybody who uh, would like to ask a question to get those in there now, and we'll select some for you to answer. Um, I have, uh, I think we can start with maybe the first one that came in. Maybe you can use it as a way of talking about if there's future potential beyond your initial critical function. Um, but it's a question from Ronald asking if you could filter out radioactive material, such as from the Fukushima wastewater. Yeah, it's a great question. I think that's a great framing more broadly too, Tom. So uh, the quick answer is, yeah, probably. Um, you know, the, the blessing and the curse of a membrane filtration technology, and it's not unique. I mean, many, many materials innovations are indeed platform technologies. And so that's certainly true of citration as well. If you saw my talk four years ago, I think I was talking about industrial wastewater, including textiles and oil and gas. So obviously we've gone far from that. And we may in the future go back to that. So in the context of um, you know, nuclear reactor wastewater, for instance, in Fukushima and elsewhere, we, we do entertain a lot of interesting applications like that when number one, they can add a lot of value, either societally, environmentally, or, or economically. That's a really important box to tick, of course. Um, and number two, we have to have sort of a differentiated product market fit. So when we approach stakeholders, and especially in new or, or diverse markets, and I'll, I'll try to be brief here, you know, we first learn a lot. You know, we don't do anything for a lot of conversations, a lot of knowledge sharing. And then we typically will do an exploratory kind of set of experiments to determine can we add unique value? And only then can we really say like, yeah, this is a great fit. We can add unique value and like, let's proceed in this direction with a joint partnership or some kind of investment mechanism, for instance. So yeah, long answer short, we, we don't know about that specific application or others, but yeah. we're certainly uh, on the lookout for, for valuable and impactful applications. As, as you look back, right at that moment where what you were envisioning doing at the start is not where you've come to today. Is there anything, if you look in your rearview mirror, you might say to the uh, early Brendan Smith CEO about how to do a different job identifying what the focus should be? Like, what did you learn that you could look backwards and maybe apply? Yeah, I definitely think so. It, it's complicated because, you know, it's not like we just decided to focus on industrial wastewater in, in the PhD and postdoc phase of, of this development. It, we were supported by certain grants and certain uh, centers that kind of helped dictate that and had a lot of great partnerships and, and learnings. And so I think, you know, I wouldn't change too much about the early phase. I think that what I would change the most is sort of free spin out, um, you know, the, the two months leading up to the incorporation of the company to really test ourselves and ask ourselves, you know, are these markets, because at that point you're no longer, no longer constrained, right? We were constrained earlier in, in our funding sources and things, but I think we didn't ask ourselves early enough or in, intensively enough is this really the market that is going to add the most value and where we're going to be the most differentiated and, and really impact uh, the industrial kind of ecosystem? So I would just place a lot more emphasis on that uh, really intensively and really early on in the company life cycle. Um, maybe a couple of technical questions just to help people understand the technology. Two of them that are in there are, what are the pressure and temperature range of the membrane and what's its lifetime? Yeah, so I'll start, lifetime's easy. So and I should say all this depends on the, the kind of conditions, of course, but generally the membrane is ultra durable. Uh, lifetime should be anywhere from five to 10 years. Of course, we, we are still performing a lot of um, kind of life cycle testing and accelerated sort of uh, cycling, for instance, to really back that up. But there's no reason why the membrane should degrade or, or crack, for instance, before that kind of time frame or even longer. Um, the second question, so pressure ranges, we've tested over uh, in excess of about 2,000 PSI, 2,000 uh, pounds per square inch in terms of pressure drop across the membrane. It's funny, it's a brittle material, but if you support it with a mechanically stable support structure, uh, the pressure really can be as high as you need it to be. I mean, there are engineering constraints as you get to 3,000, 4,000 PSI feed pressure that might make it impractical. Uh, Temperature-wise, we've probed over three or 400 degrees Celsius uh, in terms of performance. 
of course, at that kind of range, you're looking at gas filtration and no longer liquid. Um, and so we've, we've done not a lot of actually application work there, but just for our interest and our, our knowledge, we did, we have probed it over 300 degrees Celsius in terms of performance. Thank you. Um, there are some, a uh, couple of questions that I think relate in the, in the chat um, to, uh, maybe it's your future outlook, right? There are companies already in this market at various stages of development. How do you see Citration being able to penetrate the market and um, get its technology out there among competitors? Yeah, it's a great question. When we think about, you know, with all the time with investors, the board, et cetera, and the team. Um, so, you know, I love the phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. I think it's very, very uh, relevant, especially in lithium ion battery recycling, critical materials generally. So what you see is, is major kind of front runners, um, you know, like Red Oak Materials, like Northbolt over in Europe, uh, like Umicore and uh, Glencore, for instance, who work with Lifecycle and up in Canada and the US. Um, and, and these are these folks have raised billions of dollars. They already, already have the infrastructure in place. We don't think of ourselves as competitors to them. In fact, they're actually building mostly infrastructure and using very standard techniques, like the one I introduced, the hydrometallurgical or pyrometallurgical recycling. And of course, they're also now, as they've captured a lot of market share, thinking about innovating in these processes to, to make them more efficient. And that's really where Citration is going to come in as a partner and is coming in as a partner, as a um, equipment provider, a solutions provider uh, to these companies. At the same time, we don't want to be at the mercy of that. And so we are, we have developed and are continuing to develop and scale up an end to end process. So we also have the option of competing as well. Um, if it turns out that what we can provide is that much more valuable. And lastly, I would just say, in terms of competition, I think it's great. You know, we need to electrify the world, we need to recycle batteries. So that's the more the better. And I think the, the best technology with the most efficient approach should to be the one that wins out. So that's really what we're shooting for here at Citration. Um, I, I have seen you in my time here give at least a million talks to <laughs> companies and others who are interested. And uh, maybe that's an, an avenue into another question that appears a couple of times in there, which is um, you mentioned that you have a collaboration with Rio Tinto. Can you talk a little bit about that and what, what would be your ideal partner or and or what are you hoping to get out of that collaboration? Like how can industry come in and help in, in terms of your development right now? I mean, it's, it's really everything for us. Like everything we do, we before we do it in a major way, we ask ourselves, how is this advancing citration towards commercial traction, towards commercial demonstration, commercial implementation and adoption? Um, so the Rio Tinto project is a great example. You know, I think it's relatively rare to see these large corporates work with relatively early stage companies like Citration. Uh, the mining space has been incredibly progressive actually in the last five years or 10 years in realizing that they have access to all these really important materials that have not been leveraged. You know, Traditional things, obviously precious metals, uh, copper and other things. Um, but it turns out these mines have a plethora of other really important materials that have not been leveraged. And so the attention is being turned to that and, and therefore there's a lot of activity with new technologies, academics, early startups figure out how they can actually recover these resources that are becoming so, so important and valuable. Um, but more generally, we're very agnostic to how we work with corporates actually, and you kind of have to be at an early stage. So this Rio Tinto one is a great example. It's a co-development project. It's co-funded over multiple years. And the idea is that if you're able to demonstrate progress and actually demonstrate efficacy in a relevant environment, there's a further commercial opportunity. So that could be more co-development. It could be licensing. It could be um, you know, technology sale or solutions provision, um, all kinds of different models there. But generally what we, what we want to see and what we really prioritize is working with corporates who have a true stake and a true interest in what we're able to provide in terms of value. And I think that comes through best when you both kind of put in resources and work together towards a common goal. Of course, there are a lot of underlying you know, complexities like IP arrangements and cost sharing and that kind of stuff, which I won't get into. Um, a couple of other questions that I think might help some people understand the technology too. Um, is there a trade-off between porosity and pore size when smaller pores are etched? And it maybe make this like a speed round. Is your membrane selective between ions of the same valency? So uh, I'll answer the second one first because it's, it's simpler. Uh, the answer is yes to that. So I won't get into too much detail. This is also, this will be public in our IP shortly. Um, but there, there are different mechanisms we can use the membrane in. One is sort of a filtration configuration where we're doing through filtration that's enhanced by the electrical conductivity of the membrane. So that one will not so much separate based on valence. There's a second uh, approach that we use with a different type of silicon membrane, same technology, different, different morphology, 
uh, that is able to separate uh, based on ions with the same valence. So there are other, other axes of selectivity that we can employ here. I'm happy to talk, talk to people about that offline if you want to reach out later on if you're interested. Um, but we have three or four axes of selectivity that we can employ to get at really complex and really difficult feed streams in a very few number of stages, essentially. First question you asked, um, to some degree, there is a trade-off between pore size and porosity. We're able to partially kind of circumvent that through a lot of our different approaches that we use in terms of the fabrication process. But generally, you can have sort of very, very highly porous, relatively small pore membranes. If you want to go to really, really small pores, sometimes the fabrication process dictates the porosity drops off a little bit. But we've recently developed some uh, ways to get around this with some uh, really creative membrane uh, morphologies and structures that are still kind of pending in terms of patents, so I can't talk to them about it. Yeah. I, um, I, I suspect that when you were starting the company years ago, this was your this was your strength, right? Talking about the science. But now that you've started a company, uh, it, it might be that it, you know, you're know you learning on the job a kind of PhD in finance and manufacturing. Um, can you offer any advice to CEOs about how you incorporate those necessary skills mm -hmm. to complement the background in science and engineering that you have to bring? Yeah, definitely. This is, I think, an understated part of being an academic entrepreneur out of a PhD, for instance, or an undergraduate degree or what have you is that within one or two years, maybe even faster, if you're very fast moving, you're not gonna be doing anything technical. You might be communicating it to groups of people including investors, but you're not gonna be hands-on in the lab. And if you are, that's probably a bad sign because uh, it means you're not leveraging your time and the really important aspects of being a CEO. Um, and so the first thing goes back to my first key learning, which is people. So what you need to do as quickly as possible as resources allow is surround yourself with really good people to, you know take a lot of that technical development load off of your hands. And the same applies to you know, accounting, to investment, to um, you know, PR, media. You will learn as you go, but you don't want to try to do it all yourself. So the best, the best use of your time and resources is to hire really good people, work with great consultants, uh, work with great service providers, um, lawyers, accountants, et cetera. Sounds boring, but it could be, there could be a better use of your resources and, and time to kind of engage those people but you save 100x in terms of the, the effort that would be required of you to do all those things. So it's sort of a, a parallel learning and also engagement with people who can do it much better than you can. Well, one final anecdote, I think, and people have probably heard this, the job of a CEO is to make themselves irrelevant eventually uh, because you hire so many good people and engage with so many good people that eventually the company kind of runs itself. In reality, that means you can kind of focus on the next thing, right? You're building the next step of what we're doing. Uh, so you're not irrelevant, but I, I kind of like that, that quote or that notion. That's terrific. I um I had one last question for you, and then I think we'll uh, we're getting close to the end here. Uh, you had a slide up about the very different programs that you've taken advantage of, and as I was looking at that, I wondered what's the balance between having a network and feeling like you're searching for needles in haystacks as you're trying to get the resources that you need. Is there something you would suggest if we had to remake the whole system here? Does it work well? Like what you know, what has been your experience navigating this? cluster of, of resources that are out there for founders like you? Yeah, I think it's it's both great. It, it's, it's sort of, you know, drinking from the fire hose is the standard MIT uh, you know, phrase, right? And it's very true in this context as well. So it's great in that you're almost getting hit over the head with opportunities, which would not be the case elsewhere. And you know, free money, free time, free people to help you out. Um, you do want to be intentional about, I think saying no to things is also a CEO new trade that I've had to learn a little bit as well. Um, just because you don't have infinite time and resources to do what you need to do. And so in this case, I would say a lot of these programs certainly overlap uh, in some sense, but at an early stage, it's actually beneficial because you're you're just getting more and more practice at pitching, more and more practice at formulating the message and delivering critical information to partners, shareholders, investors. Um, so it, it's good, but you, you definitely want to kind of meter your engagement, I think, and make sure that everything you're doing is very intentional and directly beneficial to, to you um, as a founder, for instance. Terrific. All right. Thank you so much for giving us an update and returning to Nano Explorations. It's been great to hear this talk. You can see how to get a hold of Brendan here if you want to follow up with any questions afterward. Uh, Nano please Explorations. Do. Oh, please. I was saying, please, please do follow up if anyone's interested in, in talking further.
All right. And nano explorations will take a short break for the summertime, but we will be back in the fall. Please check out the MIT Nano website, look at our emails, and um, have a good summer. And we will see everyone on the other side. Thank you.